Let us now proceed with ecology. What is ecology? Ecology is just a branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. The population of people on Earth is increasing every day. Scientists have measured the growth to be three new people. Population, community, and ecosystem. The population of people on Earth is increasing every day. Scientists have measured the growth to be three new people every second. But people are not the only population that you can count. Another example of a population is all of the owls in a forest. A population is a group of the same organisms living in an area. Sometimes different populations live in the same area. For example, there could be a population of mice and a population of pine trees. Many populations in the same area are called a community. Within the community, populations interact. In the forest, a population of owls interact with the population of mice. Owls hunt and kill mice as they obtain food they need to survive. In a forest, non-living things interact with the community. Mountains shape the land. Rivers provide water to the animals. Soil gives a place for the trees to grow. And the sunlight provides energy to the plants. An ecosystem is a term that scientists give to all of the living and non-living things in the area. A forest is just one example of an ecosystem. Another ecosystem is the desert. A group of scorpions is a desert population. All of the scorpions, birds, reptiles, and other living things are the desert community. Add in abiotic factors to complete the desert ecosystem. Populations are all members of one species. Communities are many populations. Ecosystems include communities and the non-living parts. Population, community, and ecosystem. Okay, so let's look at this question here. An estuary is a body of water formed when... First, what is the meaning of the word estuary? It is just a body of water usually found where the rivers meet the sea. So based from that definition, what would be the answer for this question? The answer is letter, letter C. Fresh water from river flows into the ocean and mixes with salt water okay an estuary looks like this so again it's the part where the river meets the sea which one of the following jars needs more dissolved air for the fish now if you look at the jars over here they just differ in there in the number of fishes actually right so you have one two three here but which one so therefore that means that our answer will will be limited only to c or d because they both contain three right three of those fish but which of this jar will need more dissolved air is it letter c or letter d the answer is letter c why is it letter c because Take note that the fish here is bigger than the fish in choice D. Next, which of the following conditions affect the living things in an aquarium? Let's look at sentence one. The amount of water in the aquarium, does it affect the, the living things in an aquarium? Yes, okay, because if you just have few if you just have less amount of water, then that means you cannot hold that many um, living organisms in your aquarium, right? So if you want to put more fish, you need to put more water, right? Next, the amount of dissolved air in the aquarium, of course. They need 
air. Next, the number of people walking around the aquarium. Does it really matter? Of course not. So, it cannot affect. And then last statement, the place where the aquarium is set up. Is it affected by if you put it in the kitchen or if you put it in the living room? It doesn't really matter, right? So the answer is just one and two. Hence, the answer is choice A. So we're in the ocean of Southeast Asia and getting ready to search for fish that lives in a place so dangerous that most other fish won't even come near it. Ready? Let's go diving. And after a bit of searching, I finally found it. The clownfish, or anemone fish as it's also called. The beautiful tentacles of the anemone are actually deadly to most fish. The tentacles have stinging organs called nematocysts, which fire tiny darts into fish that brush by. This stinging ability protects anemones from predators and helps them capture prey for food. But how can clownfish hide in such a dangerous place? Well, that's because clownfish have a symbiotic relationship with anemones that is so important that clownfish are almost always found among anemones. Symbiotic relationships are interactions between two species that can benefit either one or both species. Symbiotic relationships are divided up into three major categories. Parasitism benefits one species while the other is harmed. Like ticks, for example. There are many examples here in the ocean. Take parasitic fish lice, for example, that cling to a host fish and feed on its body fluids. Amazingly, fish will sometimes find a cleaner fish or a cleaner shrimp to help remove the parasites from their scales, mouth and gills. When this happens, a mutualistic relationship is formed between the fish and the cleaner organism. Mutualism is a symbiotic relationship in which both species benefit from the relationship. This bird here eats the tick, which benefits the cow. In our fish example, the host fish is clean off its parasites and the cleaner fish gets a free meal. Both species benefit, but not the sea lice anymore. Hey, I already brushed my teeth today. The third symbiotic relationship is commensalism. Commensalism benefits one organism, but the other one is neither harmed nor helped. You might have had a bug hitchhiking on you at some point without knowing it. An example here in the ocean is when remoras hitch a ride on sharks, big rays or turtles. The remora attaches itself with a disc on its head and then hitch a ride and feed off the food scraps that the host animal leave behind. So the sharks are not affected by the remoras being there. But the remoras get a free ride and a free meal. Sounds good to me. So back to our clownfish. Clownfish are protected from predators by living among anemones. And in exchange, the clownfish chase away fish and other animals that could harm the anemone. What kind of symbiotic relationship is this? That's right, mutualistic. OK, but we still have one important question to answer. How can the clownfish be immune to the anemone sting? Well, a clownfish must first get used to its host anemone by developing a protective mucus coating. Kind of like when we use sunscreen. And there are two possible explanations for how this happens. The first explanation is that the clownfish secretes its own mucus, which lacks the substance that makes the anemone fire the stinging nematocysts. It's as if the clownfish had a protective force field or invisible cape. And the second explanation is that the clownfish uses mucus produced by the anemone. The unprotected clownfish initially touches the anemone with its fins, even getting stung slightly at first, but over time gains the protective mucus coating. The symbiotic relationships happen everywhere, even in our own bodies. Did you know that every time you eat yogurt, you're actually filling up your digestive tract with symbiotic bacteria? That's right, you become the host for these natural bacteria and they help you process and digest the food that you eat every day. All right, so next time you go outside, stop and look around and see how many symbiotic relationships you can spot around you and record what they are. And remember, never stop exploring your world. Okay, so let's look at this question. Which of the following statements are true about a rat and a cat? One, both are predators. Of course, that is not true right why is that because our rat is our prey 
And the cat, of course, is the predator because the predator hunts the rat. Next, the rat is the prey of the cat when the cat attacks and feeds on it. So, I just mentioned it a while ago that the rat, of course, is our prey. That is correct. Three, the cat is the pred predator and the rat is the prey when the cat attacks and feeds on the rat. That's just um, another sentence. That's just a rephrasing of sentence two. They feed on the same kind of food. Of course not. Okay, so the answer is letter B. Now, all animals, of course, they live to survive. And in order for them to survive, they need to adapt to their environment. So that is the meaning of adaptation. The ways where the animal, the ways that the animals do or what they have in their body characteristics for them to survive in their environment. Alright, which of the following help a cactus to survive in the desert? One, the leaves are broad so that they can take in more water. Actually, the leaves of a cactus are not that broad, right? So that one is eliminated. Next, the leaves are very small and needle-like so that it can reduce the loss of water. Yes, that's the reason they want to reduce the it wants to reduce the loss of water. This one is correct. It grows high and tall so that it can get more sunlight. So do cactus grow high as trees? No. So this one here is Next, it has a thick, juicy green stem for storing water and helps to carry out photosynthesis. That is actually true. There was an, actually an experiment where in, in uh, a cactus, uh, if you just leave it there and then you do not water it for a very, very long time, there is still water in its, um, uh, in its leaves and stem. Okay, so that's how it survives in the desert. So, the answer here is 2 and 4. Letter C. Next, the picture on the right, this one, shows a flower with a long slender bloom. The size and shape of a bird's beak are related to the type of food that the bird eats. Which of the following beaks is suitable for drinking nectar located deep within flowers such as the one Show. Now, take a look at this one. The nectar can be found here. So, what does it mean? You need to have a very long beak, right? So, what would be the best beak for that? The answer is letter D. See, you have very long beaks here. Okay? This one, this beak is usually for fish, right? Okay? These are for worms. These are for seeds, Okay? So the answer here is letter D. The diagram below shows a food chain. What change to this food chain was most, would most likely result in an increase in the mouse population? Now, if you look at the mouse here, it will you will have an increase in mouse population if there is an increase in its food, which in this case is the wheat, but it says here that you have decrease in the amount of wheat. What else? How about for the hawk? There will be an increase in the mouse population when you will decrease the hawks which, which feed on it. Right? So again, the answer here is either, could be either increase in the amount of wheat, but decrease because that's its food. But decrease in the number of hawks. So the only choice, the only present choice there is letter B, decrease in the number of hawks. The amount of energy that gets transferred from one level to the next is surprisingly small. Only about 10% of energy from the previous level is transferred to the next each time. Most of the energy is lost as heat, or metabolic and digestive waste, as the organism lives its life. Luckily, there are lots and lots of producers at the bottom level to supply the energy needs further up the pyramid. This does mean, however, that as you go up the pyramid, there will be fewer and fewer organisms that can be supported by the level below. That's why there are so few eagles compared to sparrows or grasshoppers in any given ecosystem.
If we humans eat chicken, which feeds on rice grains, state our role in the food chain. Let me just write the food chain there. So we have humans, we eat chicken. So I'm doing the other way around. But of course, chicken feeds on rice grains. Okay? So rice would be your producer. Chicken and humans are consumers, but chicken would be the first order consumer. Humans would be the second order consumer. Hence, the answer here is letter C.